Deciding between SN1, SN2, E1, and E2 pathways can be a daunting task. However, there are a few simple guidelines that will assist us with the choice. The nature of the substrate, the reagent, and the solvent will all affect the reaction pathway that predominates. Product mixtures are often possible. However, our focus is usually on prediction of the major organic product, and typically there is also a lesser emphasis on the prediction of accompanying minor products. There are many ways to go about this decision-making process, but one helpful approach is to begin by dividing the four possible reaction pathways in half simply by assessing the strength of the reagent. First order processes require weak nucleophiles or bases, whereas second order reactions necessitate strong nucleophiles and bases. Water and alcohols are common weak nucleophiles and bases. Most anions other than fluoride will act as strong reagents. However, some neutral species can also be strong reagents. If, for instance, they are polarizable, such as sulfur-containing species, or if they are electron-releasing, such as nitrogen-containing species, like ammonia or amines. There are also neutral strong bases that have powerfully resonance-stabilized conjugate acids. DBU and DBN would be two such examples of neutral strong bases. When a weak reagent is present, the predominant pathway is likely to be a first-order process, SM1 or E1. When a strong reagent is present, the major pathway is probably going to be a second-order process, SN2 or E2. The solvent, if it is stipulated, will help to reveal the major pathway. Polar protic solvents have a heteroatom to hydrogen bond. Water and alcohols would be good examples. The dipole present in this heteroatom to hydrogen bond efficiently stabilizes both cations and anions. And therefore, such solvents are very helpful in first order reactions where both cations and anions are formed upon dissociation of the leaving group. If water or an alcohol is the reagent, it is very common to use it in excess, thereby allowing it to do double duty as the solvent for the reaction. Polar aprotic solvents are the other major type of solvent, and these contain a heteroatom but have no heteroatom to hydrogen bond. Some examples include DMF, DMSO, acetonitrile, and acetone. Polar aprotic solvents have an accessible delta minus on the heteroatom on the periphery of the molecule. However, they have no sterically accessible delta plus. Consequently, they only effectively stabilize cations using their accessible delta minus heteroatom. This has the effect of stripping away the cations from anionic reagents, leaving them bare and more reactive than they would otherwise be. For example, sodium can be stripped from sodium methoxide, leaving bare and reactive methoxide. Polar aprotic solvents therefore favor second order reactions which require potent reagents. It is also important to examine the substrate before making a decision about the reaction's pathway. Certain substrates will essentially forbid particular reaction pathways. So we should begin by classifying the substrate as methyl, primary, secondary, tertiary, allylic, or benzylic. And we then need to consider the impact on reactivity. Keep in mind that first order processes meaning SM1 and E1 reactions, require reasonably stable carbocation intermediates. 
so primary substrates will not undergo SM1 or E1 unless they are allylic or benzylic and consequently have resonance stabilization. Also keep in mind that SN2 reaction is sensitive to steric hindrance, so tertiary substrates do not undergo SN2. In the specific example shown below, the reagent contains a polarizable sulfur atom, making it a strong nucleophile. The substrate is primary and therefore reasonably unhindered, even though there is some nearby branching. So it is suitable for SN2. In this case, the sulfur is going to actively displace bromide as a leaving group, and the cation that results loses a proton to form the neutral thioether product. In this specific example, tertiary butoxide is the reagent. It is anionic and therefore strong. Furthermore, the polar aprotic solvent, DMSO, will strip away the sodium counterion from tertiary butoxide, leaving it bare and even more reactive than it would have otherwise been. These factors suggest a second order reaction such as SN2 or E2. The primary substrate will allow for either SN2 or E2 reaction. But tertiary butoxide is pretty bulky, and this makes it a better base than nucleophile. As a result, the major pathway is expected to be E2 reaction. This substrate has only one beta position, so regiochemistry is not an issue. Tertiary butoxide pulls a proton from the only beta position in the molecule, Electrons from the fragmenting carbon-hydrogen sigma bond collapse in between alpha and beta, and this displaces bromide as the leaving group. In the example that follows, an alcohol is treated with sulfuric acid and water. So our reagents are an acid and a weak nucleophile or base. This suggests a first-order reaction. Either SM1 or E1 seems probable. The hydroxyl group is first protonated to convert it into a good leaving group. This substrate is tertiary, so when water dissociates, it leaves behind a reasonably stable tertiary carbocation. At this point, we need to decide between substitution and elimination products. Notice that heat, denoted by the capital Greek delta, was stipulated as a reaction condition. Heat typically favors elimination. The reason is that during elimination, there is an increase in entropy as the substrate fragments. At higher temperatures, this entropy term becomes significant. Having therefore decided on an E1 pathway, we know that the most highly substituted product will predominate, and that results from the loss of a proton from the most highly substituted beta position, which happens to be the one labeled simply beta. Furthermore, the favored geometric isomer places the larger ethyl groups trans to one another. However, minor products can be expected, and these minor products will include the alkene with the cis orientation of the ethyl groups, as well as alkenes that are less highly substituted that result from loss of a proton from beta prime and beta double prime. In our next example, ethanol is the reagent, and it is a weak nucleophile or base which suggests first-order reaction. The secondary substrate does allow for the requisite carbocation formation, so iodide dissociates, leaving a secondary carbocation behind. Now we need to decide between SN1 and E1 pathways. 
Notice that no heat was stipulated, and additionally, ethanol is an unhindered reagent. The combination of these two factors suggests that substitution, in this case specifically SN1, will predominate. Consequently, we expect that ethanol will attack the carbocation. Notice that the squiggly bond line that is used here denotes either configuration at the center because ethanol may attack the carbocation from above or below. Finally, a proton is lost from the oxonium ion to yield the products as a mixture of diastereomeric ethers. Notice two important subtleties in this reaction. The first is that no carbocation rearrangement took place despite the fact that there is a tertiary center within the molecule. The reason is that carbocations can only be shifted to the adjacent position. The carbocation is secondary and both positions adjacent to it are also secondary and therefore there would be no energetic benefit to rearrangement. Also, notice that the stereochemistry of the methyl group is unaltered in both of the products. And that is simply because no reaction took place at that center, and therefore there would be no reason to alter the stereochemistry at that location. The preceding was an excerpt from the book Introductory Organic Reaction Mechanisms, A Color-Coded Approach to Arrow Pushing. If you found this video to be helpful, you may be interested in the complete book, which is available in ebook format from Scribd, in paperback format from Amazon, or in paperback at a discounted price from Lulu.